Hi there. Hi everybody. Wow, that's bright. Um, my name is Nat Brown. I work at, um, at Val. I'm on the VR team. I spend most of my time working on non-Windows, Steam, and Steam VR. So you might get a chance to see um, uh, Steam VR and a VR headset connected to a Linux box today. You should take a look if that stuff interests you. Today I am talking about adapting your VR content um, to take the best advantage of the hardware that your customers have and to, take the, um, and to have the broadest reach now and in the future when hardware specs change. So more customers are going to have higher end equipment, but uh, VR equipment is going to get higher end as well. It's a continuation of some talks uh, that we've done in the past about optimizing rendering and changing your VR workload. Um, but this time, I'm not going to go into quite as much detail, and I've also got some high-level recommendations about uh, what we've learned. Because what we want to do, I think, across everything here at DevDays is um, share with you what, what we found as best practices, but we really want to share. We're not going to tell you, do this. <laughs> Here's the VR interface guidelines. Um, we want to share what we found is useful um, to save you some time, and we want to hear from you if you find things, things that are useful. So I'm going to start out by defining what we think scaling means in a couple different axes. Um, I'm going to cover what's the same and what's different about scaling um, in VR, because I, have, I think a bunch of you come from the world of writing video games where you know about some of the things I'm going to talk about, but VR has these twists. Uh, I'm going to then dive into some uh, tools and resources for scaling that I want to encourage you to put to use. Um, and this is going to get a little bit detailed, um, so don't, don't fall asleep on me. Whoops. Oh my. Got to scroll sometimes. Finally, I'm going to cycle back and talk about this scaling a little more philosophically, like why you should bother doing this. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for why you should do this. It's not just about reach. It's not just about one thing or another. I'm going to touch on a bunch of topics. And if you come away from this talk remembering that working on scaling um, is going to make your title better, look more beautiful, and run across more hardware, and it's going to, in the end, make customers happy, and you know, everything stems from customers happy, um, then I think we'll, we'll um, be happy. Oops. All right. So what, what is scaling? Scaling is adapting your content to the player's hardware. Um, typically, it's based on their CPU or their GPU capability. Um, but in a diverse hardware ecosystem like PC gaming, which is what we're in, uh, VR scaling um, uh, applies to different head-mounted devices and, and input devices as well. So um, how many of you got a chance to try the, the new controller prototype? Yeah? Oh, OK. Uh, by the way, if you didn't get a chance to um, in happy hour tonight or the social hour tonight, there's going to be another chance to do that. We really want you all to give us your feedback uh, on that. So I hope you get a chance to, and I'm sorry the lines are, are long. Um, scaling is not really conceptually unique to games or VR. Um, if any of you have done any other programming, if you're a Windows programmer or a mobile programmer, um, there's lots of different kinds of software scaling that we do to adapt our software to the capabilities of a device. Um, but because PC hardware is so diverse, um, uh, it, it, and we've always had this desire to maximize the visual quality and to let our users get the most out of their hardware, whatever it was, and we wouldn't necessarily have it all to test against. Um, scaling and tuning has been something that, that is almost uniquely uh, or uniquely prominent in gaming. Whoops, what did I do? I skipped. This trackpad is very touchy. OK. So does this look like anybody's, uh, the tuning of anybody's game UI, right? So I love modding and tuning. It's like totally what I grew up doing. But um, uh, sometimes the amount of tuning I can do in a PC game reminds me of this dialogue, or this, these toolbars in Microsoft Word. So that does happen. Um, anyway, the more, the more we've thought about it, um, that was a great example of, of overdone manual tuning. Um, uh, there are really three types or three levels of scaling uh, that are useful for games. Um, the first level of scaling is, is that manual tuning. Um, users manually tune some sets of parameters about how uh, the game is going to make use of hardware. The second level is a little bit more user-friendly, and this is when the, the, your game 
detects things about the system, whether it's the screen resolution or the, the GPU type or um, uh, the CPU uh, quality, and it tweaks the configuration um, based on what it sees. The third level we think is super duper interesting, and it it's applies to VR, and I'll tell you why, um, is it's really more user friendly. And this is when um, your game adapts dynamically, even at runtime, on a on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to changes in the system. So this isn't just the GPU workload, it's somebody adds a gamepad. Do you have to stop and start the game, right, to, to do that? Uh, that, that, can be, that can be annoying. Um, but I'm gonna show you some quick examples from the non-VR gaming world because I think they're pretty interesting. So um, I apologize at the back, these will be tough to see, but what I'm showing here is um, Dota 2, a screenshot from the video options setting area of Dota 2. Uh, when you launch Dota for the first time, probably a whole ton of players never even go and tweak any of these settings at all. But Dota launches and says, I'm in basic setting mode, I'm going to detect what a full screen game um, is, and I'm going to try to get to 30 or more frames per second. And there's a slider that, that says, use basic settings fastest or best looking. And that slider will end up somewhere for Dota based on its analysis of your, of your hardware. So, it, it detects a lot of things, and it even, oops, boy, you are sneaky. You are sneaky, PowerPoint. Let's go back, okay. So it, it detects some things about your system, and even in the background, it does a little bit of performance uh, runs. It, it does a little bit of rendering, and it says, what can this GPU actually do? Um, because maybe it's something that didn't exist when it, when it shipped. Um, so it might tweak uh, light passes or world lighting or ambient occlusion or shadows or normal maps or any number of other things that it's going to reach in and detect to figure out what to do. Um, let's see. But you can then check the button and go into advanced settings and you can manually tune those graphics settings to whatever you want. Maybe really beautiful rendering is what you want because you're taking some screenshots um, and you don't care if it's 30 frames per second, it's not about the gameplay. Um, maybe you have a free sync monitor and you want to open it up and, and, and run at 110 hertz if that's what your monitor can do. Um, maybe the game set itself and tuned itself pretty well to give you 60 frames a second, but in some really tight situation, there's too many other characters on the screen, too much, you know, too many explosions, and your frame rate drops and it screws up your game. So that's one of the reasons in VR, or in VR, in, in games that we give this tweaking, because we let people go, man, that, that ruined my game. <laughs> I need to tune that down um, so that my whole game stays at 60 frames per second, even if the scene complexity goes up. So I'm going to show you uh, some examples from Dota. So this is, um, I took a, a, a laptop with a, a Intel integrated graphics. I cranked all the settings up to the highest possible settings, and I got a really beautiful render from Dota. Everything's animated, um, great ambient occlusion, high detailed textures, highly complex, but it was only running at, at eight frames a second. Um, so then I let the system um, tune itself. Uh, yeah, I let the system tune itself, and its anti-aliasing came down, ambient occlusion turned off, shadows turned off, detailed textures turned off. Um, I even lost these butterflies that were flitting around, and, and really they shouldn't be on the battlefield, but, but they're, they're there, and they're pretty nice to flutter around you. But um, let me flip back and forth there again. You can see some things. And then... And there they go. And let's, let's uh, look up close. Oh, there's one of, one of the aforementioned butterflies. So here we are in, in like close-up detail. This looks pretty good, zoomed up close. But um, this is what it looks like uh, when it's running at 30 frames per second. Now, maybe it makes you cringe a little bit, but it's actually great that, that this tuning can happen because it's pretty cool that somebody can use a... 11-inch MacBook Air and play Dota at 30 and 40 frames a second. Um, and you can also have a high-end Titan and really, you know, really run on a much bigger screen. So I, th I think that's cool. I want to also show you scaling to adopt to input devices. Um, as game developers, we're all pretty used to this kind of crazy UI that we make um, where we want to support keyboard and mouse input as well as, as gamepad input. Um, a lot of developers I've talked to uh, really don't like the time it takes to, to build this UI, this options UI. On the other hand, 
um, it's, it's, it's required for PC games that you be able to adapt um, to what people want to do. Um, here's another example that we've introduced, which is on the one hand the same in that it's a, a big UI, it's kind of complex with a lot of choices. On the other hand, what we did is we pulled the UI and the mapping out of the application and we put it in Steam configuration and the overlay um, and we're letting uh, applications reuse that UI, which lets users um, feel kind of more consistent about configurations and remapping. And also, by, by putting in this remapping layer, um, we make it so that uh, uh, the community can share their favorite configurations and people can vote on configurations and your configurations can roam with you. I think it's, I think it's really cool. Um, let me give you another example of what that enabled us to do because we broke that out. Um, and if any of you didn't get a chance to, it's, it's, there was a great talk yesterday about the uh, Steam Controller API, really the Steam, uh, not the Steam Controller API, but the Steam Controller API, <laughs> um, where you break out actions in your application and your app thinks in terms of actions instead of in terms of actual hardware input events. And what we did um, there is now, apps that do that work, they can really react very um, smoothly and seamlessly to a mixture of uh, DualShock 4 controllers and Steam controllers, and players get the correct UI for which, whether it's the A button or the triangle or the X or the, or the B. Um, so it should be up in a couple days if you didn't get a chance to go to that talk. It's a, it's a super talk about kind of pulling input and letting it be remappable. And I think that's a part of scaling yourself to adapt to the future. Uh, a lot of my games that I still play, old games, um, are, are difficult or painful to launch because I have to go through all the configuration. So if you want your game to be more fun in the future, five years from now, <laughs> it's, it's a great idea to do this kind of quote unquote scaling work, whether you're 2D or VR. It gets even more complicated in VR. So all these things I just talked about, if you're a game developer, um, they're nothing new. If you're new to game development, they might be frightening, but, um, but they're actually a lot easier than they used to be. Um, so look at those input APIs. Um, I think for the most part, we've all just come to realize what, this, what those pain points are and we're starting to try to fix them. And we brought that knowledge of what was painful about moving forward with, with some of these uh, capabilities to VR. And VR adds these really nasty twists and they push you even harder, it's not just about what's convenient for users and can they choose their input device or does their graphics quality, can it run on lower end hardware. This is about um, really fundamental things about VR. So there are four broad categories of, of <laughs> nasty twists. Um, the first is you truly need to maintain a consistently high frame rate um, while reacting with very low uh, latency to input. So dropping even a few frames uh, or having bad simulation dynamics due to a CPU hitch um, or GPU resource uh, problem, it breaks the magic of VR. Um, it ruins the fun of VR and it can actually make people feel sick. So if your engine is not hitting frame rate, um, we, we do, and I'll talk more about this, it is possible for the, the engine, the, the VR uh, system, to reuse the last frame's rendered image and reproject it so that the user doesn't have a missed frame completely, which is very nauseating. Um, and Joe Ludwig referenced that we have some new work coming along. We're always going to be working on this problem because the world of, of graphics rendering is, you know, we cannot perfectly predict the future or what the, what the user is going to do, and I'll talk, talk about that a little bit more in a second. So we are going to continue working in that area, but reprojection to fill in missed frames, we really believe this is a, um, absolutely a safety net. So it's, it's a, a signal to your application that you need to do performance work or you need to do adaptive scaling. Excuse me. Um, we really do not want you to rely on reprojection to maintain frame rate um, uh, unless, and this is a reasonable unless, unless a customer is using a GPU below, a GPU below your recommended minimum. So if, you know, all bets are off if a, if a user <laughs> is using a GPU b below what you recommend. Okay. Um, the other, one of the other, the second really tough constraint and uh, I bet a lot of you have hit this one, is that players have ridiculously extreme camera control in VR. 
So in a traditional first-person shooter game, right, I'm moving in a plane through a path, and I've got a giant collider around me, and I really can't poke my head in a wall, and my gun's right here, and I can't put it up to my face and look at it. In VR, I can do all of those things, and I can lie down on the floor and look underneath that cabinet that better look nice. It, it can't just be something I could never get into. So um, all sorts of graphics hotspots that we used to deal with by changing some of these constraints about where people could go, those just go away in VR. We no longer have those tools at our disposal to, to kind of constrain the viewpoint. So, um, let's see. Oops, I guess I thought I was on my next slide. Okay, um, let me make this point some more. <laughs> when I demo in VR, um, I often use tilt brush as a first experience. Um, I think it's a great way because it's so intuitive for people. They, they, they go, oh, I'm drawing. And then they draw something in front of them in 2D. And then I say, hey, you know, move to the side. And they go, wow, I can move to the side. But then I really blow their mind when I tell them to lie down on the floor and, and look up at what they've drawn. And once they've done that, they really, really get VR. But it's a, it's a good example of what would probably break most games that have been designed as 2D games. You know, nobody expects to go underneath a, a bench or, or uh, the other example we use is, you know, underneath this robot in Aperture Robot Repair. Um, so Alex Flacos tells a story of one time he was giving a demo to somebody and he turned away and was talking and he turns back and somebody's on the floor looking up underneath, you know, Atlas the robot. It's like, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> the performance was was not n not any good because no one ever thought to optimize um, that area. Okay, the, the final, or the second to final, I'm sorry, the final kind of graphics related issue ab about um, scaling in VR is that more than traditional monitor based games, uh, players expect to be able to directly manipulate lots of objects. So anything you put in front of them, they expect to be able to manipulate. And that might mean that if they see a bookshelf with books on it, they're gonna grab all of the books and they're gonna pile them up and then they're going to go to other rooms and get those books too. They're going to get a thousand books and they're going to put them in a pile and then they're going to maybe shoot them or blow them up or something that, that your physics engine is not ready for or your, your graphics engine is not ready for. So that's what people do in VR. And in fact, if you try to put constraints on the system like, oh, only 20 books at a time will come out of the, the, the shelf, people will go, oh, man, this game is stupid, like only, why did only 20 books come out? So you, there's these things that, that um, will break immersion for your player, and they will also break your rendering engine for you. So we gotta figure out a solution. The last thing that's tough about VR scaling um, is that it is such early, 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 early days for VR and VR headsets. You, you just saw a prototype. It's pretty radically different from the first Mr. Hat. It's pretty different from the shipping Vive controller. Um, and that's just one prototype. There are, uh, maybe even some folks in the audience here, are people who are licensing uh, SteamVR tracking technology to build all sorts of new peripherals. And they're gonna come up with good ideas, we're gonna come up with good ideas, and we hope everyone comes up with good ideas for new peripherals. So the thing is, um, you know, we're at the wooden mouse and wooden cased computer stage of VR hardware design. Um, you know, if you've, if you've ever seen one of those early mice, it has, those are crazy. I mean, it's a wheel inside of a wooden, a wooden box, and it's, it probably felt as amazing to that first person who used it in 1968 as, as Mr. Hat felt to us. We were like, wow, this is amazing. And, it, and Mr. Hat's gonna look just as horrible as that mouse looks to you uh, right now, probably in less than 40 years. Like, it took 40 years for that mouse to look pretty ridiculous, but, but it, it won't take as long for us to have different controllers. But in any case, and that's just the input device, Headset resolutions and refresh rates are also going to be um, increasing dramatically. Uh, is anyone here developing for PlayStation VR? Anyone? Yeah, so a couple people who've, who've said, wow, you know, I thought 90 hertz was horrible. 120 hertz is pretty, pretty rough also. <laughs> so things like that are going to happen, and much larger resolution panels are going to be inside of, um, inside of headsets. So, um, so for your game to last from today to even next year or the year after that and have longevity, we want you to think about the fact that all of this is changing very quickly. We, we want your, the things you make 
to be available. We, we don't want a lot of dead stale apps around. And we encourage you to not want them either. You, know, you don't have to if you don't want to, but there's some easy steps you can take so that you scale up to that new hardware. And then you know, you'll get more sales. You'll get more feedback from your, from your customers. OK, um, so how do you actually do this work? I've, I've maybe spent a little longer than I wanted to talking about, um, about what the problems are. Um, but what do we actually do to work on scaling? So this, this part of the talk is about some specific resources. Um, these are our currently recommended best practices in a couple of areas. Um, but I do hope you know, we want to hear from you if you have recommended best practices about how to react to input or how to, how to render more efficiently or, or what you're doing. We really want to hear about it. So, and, and so do your peers. <laughs> Share in the community, please. So I'm going to start with the less complex of the two, although it's not uncomplex, <laughs> which is um, scaling your game's response to different input devices. So I covered a little bit of this um, when I was talking about the Steam controller in DualShock 4. So you may, you may see a theme kind of running through our desire to abstract input a little bit from, from applications. Um, but there's some pictures of a few different types of input devices that even if you wrote a game today, you might run into some of these devices um, uh, running on SteamVR if you, shipped your, if you shipped your app on SteamVR. So just like differently shaped, whoops, I did it again. I don't, I'm, a, I'm kind of more of a Mac person, so when I, when I have a trackpad that goes the wrong direction, it sometimes throws me off. Um, okay, <laughs> so just like differently shaped gamepads um, need different buff button mappings, um, something that games uh, used to handle internally, all their mapping and their mapping UI, um, it's starting to get easier for developers and users with those external input remapping interfaces. In VR, um, we need the ability to remap actions to different buttons across these different types of controllers, so that some of which have joysticks and some of which have capacitive sensors and some of which have um, grip buttons and some of which have other things. Yeah. So, Turns out, inside of OpenVR, we have a, uh, an interface, which is you know, just a collection of methods called IVR system. And on IVR system, um, this is not super hard stuff at all. So um, as part of, as, as part of um, your input loop inside of OpenVR, when you're looking for events from the system, like a button press or, a, or you're getting a current pose, um, you, you ask for events, and you can get the controller state. And the controller state comes back with some of these constants that are sort of well-defined, like, hey, here's the system button, uh, and here's the grip button, and the A button, and, and here are the axes, OK? Um, if somebody out there, if you're building a driver for a new piece of hardware, basically you, you write a DLL that lives underneath OpenVR and interfaces with your hardware, you convert um, you create the mapping between your hardware events and these IDs like system button or so forth. Um, on the other side of it, in the application, the application gets events out like system button or grip button or access this or access that. So in OpenVR, we've left a little opening for remapping to occur. We're not quite there yet at the same level of detail that Steam, uh, the Steam controller is with input remapping, but we did leave a kind of a convenient <coughs> parking place for it, if you, if you will. Um, there, there are some other methods in the controller subsection of IVR system um, that you might also check out, um, like you can get the name of a button. Um, that might be a user presentable name if you're building some UI around it. And there's a, a, a place that you'll use that, for example. Um, so here's the full gigantic data structure um, that you're going to be dealing with as you read events from the OpenVR input queue. Um, you get back a VR controller state T structure. Now, a lot of you are using Unity. These are getting percolated up into uh, different kinds of input events. But all you need to do is open up the C sharp code and you'll see these almost exactly these same data structures that are that are flowing up into the system. So you know, I'm showing you a little bit deeper than maybe you necessarily are seeing in your day-to-day -day programming, but um, this is what's flowing up from OpenVR and, and it's uh, it's already abstracting away the underlying different kinds of controllers uh, for you. Um, so you get back this controller state structure and you find out which buttons are touched or which are pressed um, and which analog, which analog buttons or, or um, axes are um, in what state. 
Um, I think I said this about the driver. So this is where it gets a little more complicated in VR. Um, it's that consistent in-game UI where, uh, that I was talking about, um, how you figure out where to put any kind of tool tips when you're teaching users which control surfaces do what. So, you know, it, all of us want to build UI like this when, when we're trying to teach our users during a tutorial or at some point in the game, like, hey, you got to press here to do this activity. Well, in VR, um, these controller models, there's a, they're, they're going to be different. Right? The controller model for that prototype you saw is a very different beast from the, from the um, Vive controller. And it's a very different beast. Well, not the Vive controller and Mr. Hat controller are pretty, pretty similar. But still, things are slightly off and slightly different. Fortunately, uh, we knew, <laughs> or we expected, or we planned for, and we want a diversity of input devices because we want to see people experimenting about what the best shape is and the most ergonomic shape and, and what things uh, people like in VR. So what we did is um, we make it so that new input devices can provide their own 3D model um, of the device and they can provide um, 3D, like sub 3D models of each kind of component within the device. So have you ever held up the Vive controller and squeeze the trigger and you see the trigger moving and you're like, well, that, that's really weird and it's really cool. Or, or you see the little touch point on the trackpad when you wiggle your finger. So that is not special uh, code that we wrote. <laughs> like, that's not specialized code. That is actually generic code that anybody who builds a piece of hardware can provide the information that causes the VR system to do exactly that same thing. And the code that, um, uh, the code that Tiltbrush wrote, I think this one's from Tiltbrush, the one that Tiltbrush wrote that, that shows these tooltips flying up in space that are facing you no matter how you move the controller around, um, uh, anyone could write that for any controller. Because what we do is you can enumerate um, components. There's these basically these four APIs that are up here. Um, you can get the number of components that are part of the model. Um, you can get the component's name, um, so you can display that. Uh, you can get the button mask, which is associates this component with which one of those well-known IDs that we had um, back that are going to be generating events for you. Um, and then you can get the component state, um, which gives you this thing called a render model underscore component state T. And that tells you what the coordinate system is and where a good place to point a tooltip would be if you wanted to hover something. So, as I was putting this talk together, <laughs> I, realized, I, I realized, wow, making a sample application to display all of these labels on all the components, um, uh, that would be a good sample for the OpenVR uh, SDK. Um, I've put it on my notes for some, something in my copious spare time that, that um, I'll do. But if, uh, if one of you has some spare time and wants to try out uh, this and submit a pull request, I will take a look at it. <laughs> I'd love to see that. All right. So that's, that's it for input for now. Um, on to graphics tools and resources uh, for scaling. If you're a super low-level programmer, um, there are two hours worth of videos here that, that, oh, that doesn't quite, something got snipped. There are two hours worth of videos here that are really, really good. Alex dives into tremendous detail um, about techniques for rendering uh, details and materials properly in VR that are, tuned to the things that happen in stereo rendering, um, how to sequence your CPU simulation and your GPU rendering, because there's some things that you want to do to get a running start on the next frame of simulation on where you pick up poses and on where you um, begin submitting rendering calls to make sure that you're filling up the GPU and not having a big bubble floating around in there. Um, the second talk from just in March um, is even more advanced rendering techniques that bring us even further forward to what we've learned since the March uh, GDC. And that has rendering techniques from multiple GPUs. Um, and it introduces even more detail about what I'm going to talk about, scaling and adaptive quality graphics techniques, and the rationalization behind them even more in more detail than I do. I'm going to give you a kind of an overview. Um, it, it's an overview, but it's 
It's a, more detailed than a lot of people who aren't writing engines need, but I, I think it's important for us to have this terminology and for us to, um, to know what our engines are doing for us, at least at, at a certain level, because then we have more trust in them and we can understand when we're debugging what's going on, we can see what's happening in the performance traces and so forth. So I, I'd love to get all of us on the same page about what adaptive quality is, even if, even if you're not gonna go out and write a, a low-level engine. I, I hope this will help. Um, oops. Okay, let's see if I can do that again. <laughs> All right. So adaptive quality is just a way to dynamically change the render settings uh, to maintain framework while also maximizing the GPU throughput. Um, so you can scale up on better hardware or on a scene that doesn't have a lot of complexity or down, depending on the viewpoint. So Remember I said, you know, somebody lies down underneath the robot. You, you know, in the old days, we just wouldn't allow somebody to do that. Um, now we can't control that. So instead, we have to figure out a way to adapt to where the user is going to be. And, um, and that's what adaptive quality is all about. There are really these two goals with adaptive quality. Uh, the first is to reduce the chances of dropping frames, making people sick and causing reprojection for long periods of time. The occasional reprojection is okay. If it's a safety net, that's what it's there for. But dropping into reprojection for long periods of time, we want to avoid that. So we're going to adaptively scale to avoid staying in reprojection for a long time. The second goal is to increase the quality when we have idle uh, GPU cycles. So for this, the example that I'm going to use um, is, or, and the example that Alex used, is Aperture Robot Repair. The, the demo that you've all maybe tried, and also the one that we use for the VR performance test where we sort of check out the performance capabilities of your machine, and we, we give you a score between, I don't know, 0 and 11, or is it just 10? I think, it's, I think it might be 11, because it goes to 11. Um, and in this demo, um, this demo, without changing the underlying shader code or the rendering path at all, um, Alex was able to tune this using the adaptive quality techniques that, that I'm going I'm to gloss over a little bit here to run robot repair on an NVIDIA 680, which is a four-year-old uh, GPU. And so, and that's kind of cool. It's kind of cool to be able to say, hey, this might not run at super high quality, but that 680 can actually handle the VR hardware. It can perform tracking, and it can, it can fill pixels, just not quite as well as a higher end machine can. Okay, so the benefit, did I skip something? No, I got it. No, I did skip something. I apologize, I should have used, I should have used my own Mac, Mac here. Okay. Okay, no I didn't. This is one of those ones where PowerPoint's like, oh, when you go backwards, the animation just doesn't do anything, so, okay. So the, the benefits to adaptive quality, some of them are obvious and some of them are not. The obvious benefit um, is that if you build an adaptive quality system, you're gonna lower your min GPU spec, uh, and you're going to be able to run on lower-end hardware without having to change any of your code. Uh, a less obvious benefit is that you actually change the way your artists deal with assets. So in the past, when I would browse through um, my game and I would find performance hotspots, I would say, okay, you know, hey, art team, this area, this model's too complex, the textures are too complex, what can we do? Can we tune down, you know, kind of overall quality in this entire area? in order to make this kind of consistent frame rate. So, and then your artists would go and they would dumb down some assets, and then the whole scene would have dumbed down assets. And when you, sh you know, two years later, it would still have the dumbed down assets, even on a, C on a GPU that could handle it. So, um, the goal is that uh, the, the user might see slightly lower quality renderings of those higher quality assets, but the higher quality assets are in there, and your asset team is not spending time, your artists are not spending time um, making that kind of crazy, crazy trade-off. They're not involved in performance in quite the same way that they would otherwise be. So it's kind of almost always good to take people and unblock them from areas of, the, of your workflow where they should, they should focus on what they're great at, which is making great quality assets. And the renderer should focus on, I'm just gonna have to tune and, and untune as it goes. Um, another obvious win is since we, we 
we kind of tune this whole algorithm towards um, hitting frame rate and not reprojection, not reprojecting, we're not going to reproject and we're not going to make people sick. So we'll still have that safety net, but we're going to be doing less of it. We're going to prefer to hit frame rate with slightly lesser quality for when we need to. So those were the anticipated benefits. The unanticipated, unanticipated benefit, and actually the craziest great benefit, um, was that our apps look better on all hardware, and as you add more hardware, the app just looks better and better and better. Um, and, you know, whether you think this is an asset or not depends on, <laughs> on whether you like using electricity. We, we also, you know, we maximize our use of the GPU. These, these algorithms tune up and keep the GPU fully utilized. So, you know, you paid for those transistors, you, you should put them to use. So, that's, that's what we do. So there are some um, settings that you can't adjust, and there's some settings that you can't. So in Dota, remember, Dota, I, I, I turned off all the settings and I lost, you know, um, uh, I, I lost uh, ambient occlusion and shadows, and I lost entire ferns and those butterflies disappeared. So I can't dynamically turn off and on butterflies. Like in VR, if, we, if, if I moved and there was a big pile of butterflies, I can't just turn them off. <laughs> um, I could change the resolution. I can change things that don't affect the content. Like I can't add and remove shadows as I move my head around. So there are some things I can, I can add and there's some things that I, that I can't add or change or adjust. Um, and there are some things listed here at the bottom, um, some things I can adjust. I'm, you know, the, the things that are, easy, low-hanging fruit that have a massive impact that we use a lot, what we consider best practices, are adjusting the, the rendering resolution, so dynamic resolution, um, and changing the MSAA level um, or the anti-aliasing uh, algorithm that you're using. Because MSAA is one algorithm that looks great in VR. Uh, another algorithm would be, you know, massive render targets and your own, your own uh, scaling, you know. Um, but that's a story for another day, perhaps. Um, these two others at the bottom, fixed foveated rendering and radial density um, masking, if you're interested in those, Alex goes into deep detail about them. Um, the thing is, these are some things we've uncovered. Uh, go dig in and find other things that you can do. You, you might have some things that are very specific to your game, like particle systems that, that you can turn off for a whole area that, that makes sense, where um, that's just not an example I use. So keep your eyes out for things that you can tune off in a reasonable way that don't, that, that make visual sense, right? That's, these ones make visual sense. So that's what you're looking for, is things that you can tweak to make visual sense. So I'm gonna show you a video in a second of what, um, what tuning robot repair was like, but I want to show you this kind of slide, uh, kind of table. These are the levels that Alex built into the source engine um, that are the dynamic levels of what we're submitting to the VR system on a frame-to-frame -frame basis. So when we launch, we start at the default level of zero, which is uh, uh, 4x MSAA, we're at one, a multiplier on the resolution, and by resolution, I mean the recommended render target for the for VR, which is already larger than the actual panel size, right? Um, so the, the panel size is is a certain size. We already um, we already ask you to render into a larger render target because of the distortion changes and other things that we're going to do to to sample down, and so at this level, we're just saying, hey, take the render target size that that the rendering system gave you. These numbers are all for the, for the, for the Vive headset, by the way. So 1x just means exactly what you would, um, what the VR system says the target size is. You can pass any size you want into OpenVR. So OpenVR says, hey, my preferred render target size is, is this. You can pass it in a much bigger render target and it will squeeze it down and do the things that it needs to do. Um, and you can pass it something very small. So that's what this, this table is about, it's about you having some levels in your code that say, hey, I'm at, I'm at level zero, um, I could scale all the way up to six, which is 8x MSAA, and oh, I guess that scaled, sorry about that, or that rolled, sorry about that, or 1.4 times the resolution, which is a pretty giant rendering resolution, or it can scale all the way down. Um, two things down here that are sort of interesting is there's some choices that you can make in how far down you go in performance based on whether there's text 
happening. Um, what, what we found is that if you have text um, that people need to read, um, even if you make the text bigger than, than, you, than you would normally want to um, for the purposes of allowing adaptive quality to happen, um, you really don't want to go down lower um, than 0.81 scale of the recommended render target size. If you're in an area with no text, you can go down even further. And when you are using text or not using text, we have some other, uh, you know, in, in our implementation in the Source 2 engine, um, for the very lowest level, we implement radial density masking at that lowest, lowest level. And because that, that involves a lot lower pixel fill rate, um, that might be different in different engines uh, or, my, or on different graphics cards. Um, and with text, we give a hint to the system that if we have text, we can't go lower than, than, uh, than 0.81. And what, but what we do do is we tell the, the system, hey, it's OK to reproject right now. I'm, I'm cool with that. If you need to reproject, reproject. Because if I don't reproject, if you don't reproject, this text is illegible. So these are the things that you tune. And you, you might have something different from text. Like these are the things that we tested. When you're picking these scales, they might be different for your application. These are not hard absolutes. This is just kind of a, a, a bit of a, of a window into how we, um, we thought about it. So this is Aperture Robot Repair running with adaptive quality. In the middle of the screen is, um, this is a slider. And it's moving between negative, you know, those levels I just showed you on the other, on the other, uh, uh, in that table. It's going between negative four and, and plus eight. So, as you move your head around to this very simple area, you notice the quality scales up. As you walk over to a complex, um, you know, some complex models, we have to pull back the quality in order to hit frame rate. As we go over to a panel with a lot of uh, complex textures, we scale back a little bit more. As we go and look at the robot up close, um, I think it'll do it here in a second. Like, yeah, we can go up to super high quality um, against this wall that really doesn't have much complexity. And then as we include more and more geometry and other things, um, the texture, the, 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 um, this, the quality factor scales. So what's interesting here is we are changing um, quality levels frame to frame to frame to frame. This is not like oh, between scenes, we're going to change, change from one quality to another. Adaptive quality is really adaptive at the 90 times a second kind of speed. And so it does take you reaching into an engine and, and doing some interesting work. In order to do this, you have to actually like, in order to decide, oh, I'm, I'm at level zero and I, and I have more GPU time left, I'm going to use it to render, um, to higher render targets so that there's more quality pixels. Or I'm taking too long, what do I do? You have to measure your GPU workload. So your GPU workload isn't always solid. There can be bubbles in it. Um, uh, the VR system GPU workload is pretty variable. Um, well, it's small, but it's variable. So it's small because we don't have much to do. We're just doing uh, chromatic aberration correction and lens distortion. Uh, sometimes, if you're near the chaperone boundaries, we have a little bit of chaperone boundaries to draw, right? And if an application has a bunch of, um, of overlays, we have overlays to draw. Um, and if you're using the front-facing camera to, to, um, to kind of for, for the safety features, then we have even more work to do. So it's not very much work, but there's a little bit of work to do. So that little, there are these two spots here you see. There's a, a little green blurp over here, which is um, where we have a little bit of cleaning up and setup to do for on the GPU to get ourselves ready and to talk with the driver about where VSync was and when we want to, when we want to, um, have our work to do to, to set aside some time for us. And then at the end, after you've submitted, um, after the application has submitted its content, this picture is a little, um, maybe it, it, it may look like, oh, I finished submitting my content to the GPU, to the compositor rather, and that's when the compositor decides to start doing its work. That's not the case. If, if your GP, GP work was way over here, the, the compositor still wouldn't kind of finish its work until later because it, it wants to wait and do its work and, and get it done um, closer to, closer to VSync. 
But what you do have is you, you want to ask the system um, how much time you used and how much time it has left. So in order to do that, you really have to ask the VR system. You have to ask the compositor. And you do that um, through some API calls that I'm going to talk, uh, talk about in a second. So another weird thing, though, about this is if you think about it, uh, the VR system only knows how much time you took and how much GPU got consumed uh, after it did the work. So when you ask the system, uh, how much time did it take? Do, am I running out of time in, in, a, in a present cycle? Uh, the, the system is going to tell you all the information about the previous frame. Okay? So your GPU query is already one frame old. So that's one thing I want you to think about. The other thing is, for us in Source 2, we actually also have some frames in the queue that are already um, in flight and can't be worked on. So they're already kind of rendering commands and setup commands and clearing commands that have started. And you can see that here in this red render one and the orange render two. We get that timer way up there. And we might be able to, uh, to do something about that render two that's happening. In our case, we actually can't because we've actually done all the game simulation and render prep before we even have a chance to pick up that timing information. So render prep there are things like, I've, you know, I've set aside a render target, right? I've, I, I, can't, I can't way over there suddenly change all of that. I've got to start submitting some, some stuff but, um, uh, prior to, prior to VSync, or I've, I've left a big, uh, a big bubble of, of performance behind. So, what that means is that if somebody's moving their head to an area that has a lot of detail and performance is about to drop through the roof drop through the floor, fly through the roof. <laughs> um, if performance is about to, to go nuts, you actually don't have a perfect indicator of that. You don't know that it's the next frame that's going to be bad. You, it might be that the next frame and the frame after that are in trouble. Okay, So because of that, your algorithm has to look a little, it's not very complicated, <laughs> but your algorithm has to do a couple things. So if your goal is to maintain this 70 to 90% GPU utilization, um, what you need to do is, if you're, you're only, if you're, if you're under 10% of time left at the end of your frame, so you measure 10% and that was the last frame, you need to say to yourself, well, if I wasn't previously above 90% and I now am above 90%, things are going south. So what you do is you pull back um, two levels of quality as quickly as you can. So you, you basically tell yourself, whatever next frame I get a chance to submit, which is maybe two frames later, maybe one frame later, depending on your system, I need to scale back right now. <clears throat> if you detect that your GPU utilization is low, then you should increase conservatively. So if you're high, you need to pull back quick. If you're low, you need to scooch forward slowly. And so if, if you find yourself not using enough GPU, just step one step higher in the quality level. And it really is, what we found is in, in our a bunch of tests, um, if the last three frames finished below the 70% threshold, then increase a level and don't do anything for another two frames. So it's really not just like, you know, take a step, Wait three more frames, take a step. And it sounds like a long time, you know, but we're, we're talking three frames, 33 milliseconds. So in the world of computers, it's slow as paced. In the, in the world of our eyes, it's OK. But the last, the last note is, is pretty important, which is <clears throat> you can move your, your head so quickly, and complexity can change so quickly, that you might not get an indication that's fast enough, even though we told you if, if you achieve over 90% utilization, back up as quick as you can. It turns out that's not fast enough. If, if all you do is that, and even if you backed up three, even if you backed up four quality levels, you're going to have a bunch of, a bunch of um, reprojection or missed frames. Okay? So instead, you should start looking at things to do by linear, linearly projecting forward 
the amount of time that you had as you start to cross 85%. So if you jumped from 65% to 85% over the course of a couple frames, you're on a pretty crappy trajectory to <laughs> not be able to pull back fast enough on quality to avoid missing a frame. Um, so you want to keep track of what you've been doing, and if your trajectory is towards 90% and you know, you know you can't pull back faster than one or two frames, pull back a little sooner, start to scale back. <clears throat> what we found was that combination of just analyzing a small amount of data on a per frame basis, it was pretty easy to um, keep ourselves within frame rate and avoid reprojection almost entirely. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> Excuse me one second. All right. Let's see. Oh, I only have a little bit more time, so I'm going to switch through a couple things. Um, the one last thing I'm going to say about this aspect of graphics adaptive quality is we set up a rule which, is a, which we think is pretty important. We, we put a, a cap of that 10%. Like, it would be great to utilize the whole CPU. Like I said, you, you paid for those transistors. Like, it's great to use them. Turns out there are other people on the system that like those transistors too. So Windows would like a couple transistors occasionally um, to do other things. Like, I don't know, change the clock or, or move a window around. I don't know what they do. But they do use a little bit of GPU occasionally. And if you don't leave a little gap for that, um, they're going to impact you and cause you to stutter. So leave a little bit of room, and everybody will have enough time to get things done. So um, the final point is, you know, we used to talk about 11.11 11 .11 milliseconds and saying, wow, that's a hard target. You know, the, the target's actually harder than that because the target is actually 10 milliseconds. You definitely, we haven't found that it's possible to soak up everything for VR. We have to leave uh, room for other stuff in a multitasking operating system in order to have stable performance. Okay. So I'm going to quickly talk about these resources, this other resource, um, which is um, less complex. So adaptive scaling is, is a tool. I hope you'll, you'll think about it. How, how you um, find out that you want to do adaptive scaling or take a look at it is you, you use these tools. So there's a VR frame timing tool that's built into Steam VR. You can pop, pop it open, and it'll show you a bunch of information that's based on these IVR compositor get frame timing and IVR compositor get frame timing frame time remaining APIs. And we use them in the tool to show you graphs of what's going on. So this is a screenshot of what Steam VR, um, the frame timing window, can show you. And this is looking like on the one hand, like last year, we might have said, hey, this is looking great. Your application is totally in perf. Um, it's you know, it's got, got five and a half milliseconds every frame left, no problem. Another way of looking at this, though, is like, wait a minute, you, you could do a whole lot more graphical quality here. You could scale up and use a lot more of the GPU and get, get better pixels in front of people's eyeballs. Um, when you dig into details, you'll actually see a lot of interesting information about um, exactly which stages in the normal sequence of calls that applications do about waiting for poses, presenting, and doing the various steps about submitting data to the API are doing. And you'll see some interesting things in here. For example, oops, for example, I'll skip over that. Um, for example, here's an interesting one. This one shows um, this red line are uh, when wait get poses is called. Wait get poses is where you're asking the VR system for the pose of the headset and, and the controls, but the pose of the headset so you know um, where, you know, basically how to, how to project your image. So you, you wait for that, and obviously something is wrong here. In this particular picture, um, uh, if, if I were to see this in somebody's application and they said, oh yeah, I'm using Unity, I would say, okay, go look. Go look at a Unity performance trace and see what's happening because you've got a stall here somewhere on the render thread that is causing the normal sequence of wait get poses to, you know, take take a, a lot a lot more time than it should. And so, you know, this one, even if you were uh, uh, optimizing your graphics properly, weird little things in your application can trigger reprojection and could also cause your adaptive quality to flutter all over the place a little bit. So. You know, adaptive quality doesn't, doesn't uh, absolve you of fixing bugs in your own code. <laughs> um, you still will want to look at these frame timing uh, traces 
and see things that just don't make sense. So red spikes like that, where you're looking at weight gap poses, or almost all of those, you know, there are, there are things to look at and see. And there's a lot of good talk in, on co community pages about how to read these traces. So, and I've, I've put some links in there about those. Um, here's, here's the last example I'll show you from the frame timing tool, um, which is this red bar shows when this application entered reprojection, and it stayed there for a while. It stayed there for, you know, 200, 200 ish frames, I think, something like that. It stayed there for 200 frames, which is, which is two seconds. So th that was a long time. If you saw that in your application, you would, you should say to yourself. Um, uh, this is a great opportunity for adaptive quality, <laughs> right there. Um, but you, you should say to yourself, something's wrong. And, and by the way, this is not to say adaptive quality, you, you shouldn't stop doing some of the things you used to do to tune your content. Adaptive quality is another additional tool. It's a really useful tool to make sure you scale forward on better hardware. But you know, a bunch of your old techniques from traditional games uh, still apply. So the last thing I'll say about adaptive quality is if you're using Unity, you're in luck. <laughs> we built, um, we built a, a render that does adaptive quality on the dynamic resolution um, path um, uh, for Unity. And Unity and Unreal Engine are adding cool adaptive quality features over time. So uh, kind of we went into how the sausage is made for a lot of you. Um, these are some of these things about adapting quality to the GPU and what's happening in, uh, um, in GPU perfload are going to be maybe abstracted in your, in your engine a little bit. But now we know what we're talking about when they, when they tell you they launch a, cer a certain feature. Um, if you've tried the, r the lab render before in your project and it didn't work, one, I'm sorry. Uh, two, give it another try. Give us some feedback. Um, we fixed some bugs in it where it was like, not working really well. Um, it's a work in progress, and we want to work on it uh, with you. So I've got just a few more minutes, and I'm, I'm going to cycle back onto a couple things. We think you should take the time to do some adaptive quality work. Um, it helps you uh, pick your minimum spec that's appropriate for you. PC hardware is really, really incredibly diverse, and VR hardware is going to be even more diverse in these early days where just new hardware is just going to come out all the time. So um, we love that customers in the PC space, they mix and match CPUs and GPUs and motherboards and I.O. systems like mad. And that's awesome because it, it means that innovation is happening and it means that experimentation is happening. Um, but it can be, it can be hard. Um, VR makes it more complicated, but some of these techniques will make your content that you build survive longer. So we, we think that's good. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, that should give your content a longer uh, reach, a broader reach, and a longer appeal over time. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, doing this adaptive scaling work is, is actually good for the ecosystem as a whole. So it's good for you. Um, and it's good for hardware makers. So when a hardware maker comes along with a, you know, I'll just, a 10K by 10K VR headset, right? If, if that um, hardware maker, if they can grab your content that was written last year and it can scale its way up to this super high-end um, device and your assets are scalable and your content is scalable and you adapt to new input devices, that hardware, I, I promise you, that hardware developer is going to make a better headset because they have a bunch of, of software to test. If your software maxes out and can't drive a higher headset, it's going to be like, you know, when you saw your first 4K TV at a store and everyone was like, yeah, but that's, that's just 1080p content scaled up. It didn't maximize, like, it didn't make people want to buy that 4K TV. You guys have the opportunity to make your content make that hardware look better and to make the whole ecosystem stronger and in a virtuous cycle like that. Because it's much easier for them to, uh, to do great work when there's content that runs on their system. So I have a, a bunch more slides, not a bunch more, I have a couple more slides about um, what makes great VR. But I'm going to skip them. And I'll put, uh, you'll, you'll see them in the slide deck that we put online at some point. Um, because I think we've covered a bunch of good topics here. Um, scaling in VR is about adapting 
to the requirements of the machine. It's different from, a little bit different, a little bit the same from normal PC gaming. And it has this added um, benefit of helping out the whole ecosystem, and we're all gonna get kind of cooler hardware um, and cooler controllers and devices um, if you do this work. And we would love to hear what you're doing. Um, we'd love to, um, if, you, if you have an engine you're working with, uh, um, if you're making a custom engine, if you have feedback for your engine provider that we can help with, please reach out, because um, uh, we, we love having you build things uh, for VR and over open VR, and uh, let us help. So thanks, and I'll be around for questions.